The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him a Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. It's a phrase that we hear often repeated in the context of Catholic engagement in political and public life. The dilemma that it speaks to is not a new one. We know from today's gospel that this is a question that Jesus himself had to grapple with, and the church has continued to do so through the ages, and under various forms of state and governmental structures. It seems that with each passing historical period, that we as Christians are asked and must ask ourselves anew, what are my duties to God and to Caesar? I have to admit that this is a question that has very personal implications for me. Being a lawyer by training and I suppose too by personality, it's something I reflect on often. My time as a student at the Notre Dame Law School was bookended by two presidential elections. And this year, in the midst of yet another election season, I found myself in many conversations with colleagues, friends, family, and students about the challenges and responsibilities that Catholics face when engaging in the political life of our country. On at least one occasion, upon finding out that I was a law school graduate, a student has asked me, "Is is that possible? Can you be a priest and a lawyer at the same time? Thought a lot about who should be more offended by that question, priests or lawyers. But I've also pondered the implications of this line of questioning. Whether it's possible to be faithful to God and a citizen of Caesar. And if it is, then how? What does this look like in practice? Or to put it even more bluntly, Should faithful Catholics register and vote as Democrats or Republicans? It's a question that's been asked ad nauseum in recent years. We might even say has become one of the most significant and visible sources of division in the American Catholic Church today. Can you be a Catholic and Democrat? Can you be a Catholic and Republican? For some of us, the answer might seem simple and straightforward. It depends on which side of the ideological aisle or spectrum that you fall. And yet I want to suggest that these questions are not always as straightforward as we'd like them to be. My friends, our gospel today presents us with a time that Jesus found himself faced with similar politically driven questions. Perhaps in looking carefully at his response to the religious and political leaders of his time, we too can find a way forward for ourselves in this moment. In today's gospel, Jesus is caught between two parties. On the one hand, there are the Pharisees who stand firmly against the Roman rule of the Jewish people. And on the other, we have the Herodians, who at the time were loyal to King Herod and to the Roman Empire. These two groups are leaders of a Jewish people who are also fractured amongst themselves. 
There were the zealots who vehemently opposed Roman occupation, while many others had made their peace with it, and at times, as in the case of tax collectors, even benefited from the situation. The question of Roman taxation of the Jews, which was seen as evidence of political subjugation, was a hot-button, partisan, and divisive issue. It served as a tangible mark of the people's division and polarization. The Pharisees and Herodians knew this when they approached Jesus that day. So the leaders of the people want to entrap Jesus. They want to use this issue as a way of forcing him to choose political sides, to in some way reduce his teachings and message to a political issue. They know that regardless of how he responds, he will alienate a core group of his followers and so be shamed in front of the Jewish people. They begin by flattering him, telling him that they know Jesus is completely free from being bound to others' opinions of him, that he is truthful and will answer the questions honestly and openly. This is a safe place, they assure him. We simply want to know your opinion on a political issue. And so they ask him, is it lawful for a Jew to pay taxes to Rome or, to not, or not? If Jesus answers no, he can be accused of political insubordination and treason against Rome, as his answer can be interpreted as a call for political mobilization against the empire. If he answers yes, he will appear to relinquish Israel's desire for freedom and self-determination and its claim of being a people bound ultimately and only to God. The religious leaders think they have Jesus caught in the perfect trap, and it seems like an impossible quandary to those who are witnessing the exchange. But in his response, Jesus exposes the problem of the way they pose the question, as though it is a simple, straightforward, and binary question. Is it lawful or is it not? yes or no, black or white. Jesus turns the question back around on them, revealing the complexity and the lack of imagination behind it. Whose image is on the coin, he asks. Caesar's, they reply. Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. We might think that Jesus is sidestepping the question. We're dodging in a way that we're accustomed to in politics today. Yet Jesus reveals something very important in this exchange, something that's missed by those around him at the time, which I fear we miss today as well. That as followers of Jesus Christ, there is a complexity and in some ways an unresolved discord when it comes to our spiritual, moral, and political lives. There are few simple, straightforward, black and white answers. But my friends, we do have some fundamental principles to stand on, which we can draw from Jesus' words today. The first is that Caesar is not God. I think this was true in Jesus' time, and I think it is of ours. That we can let, often let our politics, our political life become the ultimate reference and driver in our lives. We allow our party and political affiliation to be the source of our identity and to act as the lenses through which we view the world rather than our identity as Christians, as beloved children of God. We ascribe to politics a kind of hope and faith that belongs to God alone. Put another way, we have only one Savior, and Caesar is not him. It's helpful to remind ourselves that God remains a central fact of all that is and the source of all the created world, including our political communities. And God will remain long after any government passes away. The second principle that Jesus gives us today is that not only is Caesar not God, but God is not Caesar. We sadly see this quite often in American political life today, especially during election seasons. We have a tendency to imagine that God is wholly on the side of either political party or candidate, that God is most likely, most like one party or another, 
but simply a more powerful and perhaps more good version of them. That a stance on a particular political issue, even indispensable and crucial issues, can fully capture and reveal to us the mystery, complexity, and depth of God's beings and plans for both the created world and the organization of our social and political lives within it. But as scriptures tell us, God's law is not our law. His thoughts and ways are not our thoughts and ways. They are above them. We cannot comprehend the mystery of his being, which in turn does not conform or map uncomfortably to our particular political affiliations. It's part of God's nature to transcend, which includes the transcending of political ideologies. Now, it might sound as if I'm almost advocating for disengagement from public life or suggesting that Christians should not have a political identity or affiliation. I assure you, brothers and sisters, I am not. What I'm proposing is that if we take a step back now and then and allow the fullness of the gospel to flood and animate the totality of our lives, we can step out into the political sphere in truly prophetic and transformative ways both inside and outside of the ballot box. Today's gospel reminds us that Jesus does not call us to enter the complexities of public or political life from a position of partisanship, but to do so through a constant commitment to prudence. Prudence, as the church defines it, is the virtue that enables us to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. Or as we in the Congregation of Holy Cross sometimes put it, prudence entails the competence to see the way forward in every situation and the courage to act appropriately. When Jesus was presented with the question about the payment of taxes, he might have immediately denounced either or both of the sides of the political divide or condemned the inauthentic posing of the question itself. But he does not. Rather, he shows us the path of prudence, demonstrating that his mission and teaching might inform, but cannot be reduced to a particular political issue. He invites us to remember that there is a higher order and an allegiance that transcends our political commitments, and that many political decisions are an act of prudence made by well-formed and well-intentioned consciences. And in exercising this prudence, Jesus draws from the Spirit of God that lives perfectly within him, the Spirit which enabled him to discern the true good in even the most complex circumstances and to choose the right means of achieving it. My friends, we too are called to exercise such prudence when we enter the complexities and ambiguities of our world. But we do not do so alone or simply through our own devices. Jesus sends us that same spirit to act as our advocate, our spirit of truth and our guide. The Holy Spirit ministers daily in our hearts by opening our eyes to see and accept God's presence in our lives and by giving us the strength to not only pursue God's will for our whole selves, but to recognize God's presence in those around us, even with those whose politics differ from our own. Because they too are our brothers and sisters, many of whom have arrived at their political convictions through similar exercises of judgment and prudence. Especially in the midst of a divisive and polarizing election season, let us pray that the Spirit of God will grant us prudence and the grace to be radical witnesses of solidarity and communion. In doing so, we respond to the call of our Holy Father, who challenged us in the most recent encyclical with these words. Quote, Let us dream, then, as a single human family, as fellow travelers along, sharing the same flesh, as children of the same earth, which is our common home, each of us bringing the richness of his or her beliefs and convictions each of us with his or her own voice, brothers and sisters all.